Hi, everyone. Welcome back to what is now, I believe, episode 10 of Cosmos Crusaders. It's pretty crazy if there's only 10 episodes. Um, so first of all, the setup is a little bit different for an introduction. Um, as you notice, Simi isn't here. Um, she's actually here for the interview that we had itself, but she's just going to make it to the intro that we were recording um, because from law school stuff, things have been really ripping up for her with regards to law school. She's been really busy um, and she's working really hard and I'm really proud of her. And I know all her hard work is definitely going to pay off. Um, and so we apologize for um, the delay in getting the next episode out to you guys. I think it's been around two months probably since we last dropped an episode, maybe even three. So we really apologize for that. Um, but thank you to everyone that's still tuned in and for supporting us. Um, things have, like I said, just been really, really busy for both of us. Um, for me, uh, I've actually been working on a paper really hard for the past three months, um, which is part of the reason why we couldn't get an episode out to you guys. Um, but I'm happy to say that the paper should be out on archive by the time this podcast drops. Um, and it's submitted to the uh, Astrophysical Journal Letters. It's on the Supernova counterpart to the brightest GRP of all time, GRB 22109A. And I'm really, really proud of this work and really thankful to all the co-authors for all the effort that we all put in. Um, so yeah, check it out if you're interested. Uh, but yeah, so all that said, again, we apologize for not being able to get this episode out to you guys earlier. But again, I appreciate the support still, and we're going to try to be more consistent as the academic year goes on. Again, might be a little bit difficult. Might be a little bit difficult with regards to I'm still taking classes. Got my second year sort of project to get my master's degree as well coming up. Uh, Simi got finals coming up to finish up her first year of law school. So a lot of stuff going on for both of us, but this is still incredibly important to both of us. So we're going to try to try our, our very best to get some more episodes out to you guys this academic year. Um, so yeah, all that said, this episode features Professor Anna Ho, who is a new professor of astronomy at Cornell uh, University. She was very recently hired, I think of fall 2022. Um, and yeah, I think our interview with her was really, really insightful and we learned a lot of things. Uh, first of all, her research is really interesting. Um, it's for me personally, incredibly interesting because a lot of my work is actually based on her thesis work. So it was really nice to hear her talk, her, to hear her talk about all the research that she does. Um, and it gives me some ideas for things on how I can actually extend that into the future. Um, and so not only her research and her career path being interesting, um, I think that people like Anna are a big reason for why I'm optimistic that we can make this field a better place in the future for the next generation, because she gives us a lot of really um, unique and good insight into sort of how we can make the field a more diverse and inclusive space for the next generation. Um, and some tangible things that we can actually do and some mentalities that sort of we need to actually have with regards to how we can make the field of astrophysics just a better place. Um, so I think with people like her spearheading this next generation, I think that with effort that all of us as a community put forth, I think that we can really make astrophysics the best sort of community possible for the years to come. So yeah, I'm going to stop talking and just get to the interview now. But again, I appreciate all the support from all you guys. Um, and thank you for being patient with us. And we hope that you enjoy this interview with Anna. So thank you. Well, we're excited to have our next guest, uh, Professor Anna Ho, uh, who is a recently hired assistant professor at Cornell just this past fall in 2022. Uh, so she graduated with a bachelor's of science in physics from MIT. And after that, she was a Fulbright scholar at the Max Planck Institute in Germany before grad school. And she graduated from Caltech in 2020 with a PhD in astrophysics with her thesis titled, The Landscape of Relativistic Stellar Explosions advised by Professor Sri Kulkarni, which also won the Springer Thesis Prize. And she was a Miller Postdoctoral Fellow at Berkeley from 2020 to 2022 before she got hired by Cornell. So welcome to the show, Anna. Thank you so much for having me. So we're going to start off by talking about your research. Um, sure. So we know generally that you study like energetic explosions like GRBs and supernova. But can you kind of describe to us some of the major questions that you try to answer through your research about these phenomena and how you do that? Yeah, sure. So I'd say there are two kinds of questions that I'm interested in. Um, the first I guess, category is maybe what I would describe as the astronomy. So there the overarching goal is to connect the properties of the living stars with the appearance and the physics of their uh, of their explosions, of their deaths, uh, and then with the properties of their corpses, uh, if they leave anything behind at all, which some of them don't. 
uh, for the ones that do uh, neutron stars and black holes. And the challenge is that we don't usually see one of these stages become the next. We see stars, we can study stars in the Milky Way. Uh, we see explosions, we mostly see them happening uh, in other galaxies. And then we see the corpses, the remnants, the neutron stars and the black holes, but actually mapping one to the other um, is, uh, is a longstanding challenge. And for a long time in the field, there was a kind of textbook story that if you know the mass of the star, you basically know everything. Um, and in the last you know, few years, last decade or so, uh, I'd say it's become really clear that that story needs to be uh, very much rewritten. And a lot of the observational pressure to rewrite that story has come from the discovery of explosions that can't be explained as kind of normal supernovae. Um, so that's where uh, a lot of the work that I do uh, comes into it. And uh, I guess that brings me to the second kind of category of question, which is more maybe in what I'll describe as the physics. So these really extreme explosions um, are also really great places to study ba very basic physical processes, which I'm really interested in. So for example, when you have um, uh, material that is traveling very close to the speed of light, how does it behave? Uh, how does it interact with ambient gas? And uh, when it forms a shock wave, how does that shock wave uh, accelerate particles, for example? And those are sort of not necessarily specific to these astrophysical systems, but these astrophysical systems are great places to try and answer those questions. Oh, and then how I approach these questions. Um, I guess a lot of the work that I do is observational. so. I use telescopes all over the earth and in space to discover these kinds of extreme explosions and try to uh, sort of watch them develop in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then once we have that data, I try to interpret it to answer some of these questions. And I think actually one of the big obstacles in what we do is that we see all these amazing things, but actually knowing what it is that you're seeing, what physical process is producing the photons that you're detecting uh, is really difficult. And if you don't know that, it's really hard to actually interpret what you're seeing. So um, I guess the, the modeling is also a big part of what I do and what I'm interested in. Yeah, those all sound like very interesting questions that I am also interested in. <laughs> um, so I guess get a little bit more specific into one part of your research that I'm also that I'm working towards right now, understanding sort of the connection between GRBs and supernovae, um, which was a big part of your thesis. So do you believe that it will ever be possible to have sort of like a clear cut roadmap that will be able to, to, to describe this connection between gamma ray bursts and supernova sort of in totality so that we can sort of predict the final stages of like a stripped envelope stars um, evolution, just given like a set of initial parameters? <laughs> yeah, there are definitely there were definitely times uh you know, in the depths of grad school when I despaired and, and asked myself uh, those same things. Uh, but but I do, I do think we will. Um, I think there are some observational developments that will happen in the next decade that will make a huge difference. So for a long time, the, you know, the discovery of these phenomena has really been dominated by surveys operating in the optical band, um, also the gamma ray band uh, for gamma ray bursts. But it's been really hard for us to sort of find the things in between because we just haven't had the right kinds of surveys. Uh, but that'll change soon. We'll have x-ray surveys, we'll have UV surveys, um, and I, we'll have radio surveys, and I think that'll uh, really help us put together a much more complete picture. And then eventually, I am optimistic that we will have neutrino detectors that are sufficiently sensitive to actually you know, see neutrinos from uh, individual extragalactic explosions. And that will enable us to even detect jets that are way buried deep inside uh, deep inside stars. So I think, um, uh, yes, I think that we will be able to establish this complete uh, mapping eventually. That's really exciting. Hopefully that happens a little like sooner rather than later yeah. <laughs> to help Gokul out with his research. Um, but yeah, that's really exciting. My next question is kind of a more broad one, just for my yeah. own understanding as someone sure. not an astrophysicist. Why, sure. why do stars die? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they die for the most part because they run out of fuel. So the reason a star is a star and it's shining 
is because it's able to tap into a reservoir of gas um, that's hydrogen, helium, it can be other elements, but uh, eventually it burns through that gas and there just isn't any more to burn. And then it can't shine anymore. Uh, and if it's uh, what we call a lower mass star, so a star that's kind of more similar to the mass of the sun, it'll die uh, pretty peacefully. It'll just sort of fade away. But if it's more massive, so more than around eight times the mass of the sun, uh, running out of gas actually results in this kind of runaway process that causes a big explosion. Cool. Yeah, it's really cool stuff on your research, Anna. Uh, I'm excited to see all the stuff that you do in the future with it. Uh, so now getting into your background a little bit. Um, so we wanted to know what sparked your interest in physics and astronomy? And when did you sort of know that you wanted to make it your career? Right. So my first memory of being interested in physics as a career is eighth grade, because my science teacher had a bookshelf of popular science books and I read some of them. And I think that was the first time that it even occurred to me that physicists, that sort of being a physicist was a career path that might be um, available to me. So I think, and I think that that theme continued kind of throughout my education, uh, being influenced by books, by popular science books, uh, and then also by sort of by, by, by mentors. Um, in high school, I actually started reading a lot of neuroscience, popular science books and thought, oh, it's so much better to do this than physics because you really, you know, you, you actually can, can help people. Um, and so when I went to undergrad, uh, I was actually planning to be a neuroscience major and, um, and become a doctor. Um, so we can talk more about that later if you're interested, but uh, I guess long story short, uh, there was a point during undergrad where I wasn't sure what I wanted to do and I was um, sort of doing informational interviews with a lot of different professors in different fields. And one of the professors I interviewed uh, was an astronomy, was an astronomer, and he lent me uh, another popular science book, which was about astronomers doing work with Palomar Observatory. And I really liked this book. And so I thought, well, I'll at least try an astronomy internship. And worst case scenario, I just sort of get this out of my system. Um, but I had a really great experience in this internship. Uh, I was really lucky. I had uh, a great, really interesting project. I had a great advisor. It was a really nice uh, research environment. And then I was also doing a lot of um, volunteering at the local public observatory. And I have a memory of giving, I used to, so I'd give public talks. I have a memory of giving a public talk and just sort of feeling like I was doing all this really cool research. I had this opportunity to share with the public uh, my excitement about what I was doing, and it just felt very right. And I think that summer was when I decided to try uh, try out a career in astronomy. Wow, that sounds like a big switch from pre-med to astronomy. But how did that <laughs> work at MIT where there's not a specific astro department like I think it's through the physics department so did you ever have like any issues trying to reconcile that and like how did you get involved with astro other than like this research that you were doing right so I guess um when I so when I came to MIT I was planning to do neuroscience but they're all incoming students are required to take classes in a bunch of different subjects. So I took physics, chemistry, biology, and I really liked the physics classes. Um, I liked that physics was this way to get at the sort of inner workings uh, of nature. Uh, I liked the kind of simplicity of uh, a physical law. And so then I thought, well, physics is a very flexible degree. So I'll major in physics, I can still be pre-med. Um, but that way, I also get to learn about all these interesting things now while I have the opportunity to. And I also had noticed that the physics faculty were very accessible and very sort of dedicated to undergraduate education. And I thought, well, you know, there's so many things to major in. I might as well pick a department where I feel like people will be, you know, I'll have, you know, I'm at this amazing research university. I want to be able to interact with the faculty. Um, so that was another reason I decided I chose it as a major. And then I think I was really looking to get a broad education. And I actually didn't do that much astronomy at MIT. Um, I did the research that I did was over the summers uh, somewhere else. And I, I think I, I took a few astronomy classes, um, but there, there actually weren't even really that many. 
but that was fine because I figured, well, if I'm doing this for the rest of my career, I might as well learn uh, about other things now while I still can. And I can always be taking these classes as a grad student. So I didn't, I don't think I ever felt like I didn't have the opportunity to do astronomy at MIT. I um, was able to do the research I wanted to do over the summers. And then I was excited to study physics more broadly while I had the chance. Definitely. Yeah, that sounds like a really interesting experience at MIT for sure. Um, so I guess, when did you finally decide that you wanted to go to graduate school for astrophysics? Yeah, I think it was that summer uh, that where summer. I did this research internship uh, that made me think that it was at least something I wanted to try. Gotcha. And what were some of the hurdles that you sort of had to overcome during undergrad? Yeah, I think there are a few different things. Um, that I could talk about. So I'll just pick a couple to focus on. I think, you know, MIT was really great for a lot of reasons. I thought it was a really stimulating environment. There are a lot of interesting people to talk to. Uh, there are so many activities to do and not enough time. Um, but it's also, it was an environment where I think undergrads put a lot of pressure on themselves to succeed and not in a competitive way. So it wasn't like I have to do better than you, but it was just an internal pressure of I have to do people had certain internal standards maybe and um, could really stress themselves out trying to meet those uh, sort of self-imposed standards. And so I think it was it could be a really stressful environment to be in. I think it, you know, you're living in a dorm, living with other people who are staying up super late, not sleeping very much, taking too many classes, doing too many activities, and you kind of merge your it's hard it can be easy to sort of merge your lifestyle uh with theirs and so I think one of the things I had to learn to do in undergrad was to figure out a system that worked well for me I don't do very well if I'm not sleeping enough um I need to exercise regularly I need to eat properly to function and be happy and so to be able to decide that you're going to do these things in a certain way and then do it even when it means maybe leaving a group hangout a little bit earlier than other people. Um, I think that was one, that's one of the things I remember having to learn to do uh, that changed a lot from when I was a freshman to, uh, to when I was a senior. And then I think also a place like MIT is very, um, you know, it's very proud of its uh, achievements in science and engineering. Um, but I always had really broad interests and I wanted to take classes in you know, literature and in music and in history. And I think MIT sometimes there could be an attitude of certain subjects being more sort of hardcore uh, and rigorous than others, uh, which I don't think was correct. And so I think also, I don't know if this was really a hurdle, but it was just something that I had to learn was to come up with my own idea about what was worth doing and just do that and not be so worried about uh, maybe what some of my peers might think. Yeah, I mean, undergrad is a big adjustment for everyone, but I think you made all the right choices. So that's really um, good advice too for people that are kind of going through the same thing right now. But um, in between undergrad and grad school, you were in Germany as a Fulbright scholar. What was that experience like? Yeah, that was a very um, enriching year. And I'm really, really glad that I did it. I'd recommend something like that to everyone uh, if they have the opportunity. It was enriching along uh, a number of different axes, which maybe is why I liked it so much. It was enriching sort of professionally, intellectually. I had this really interesting project. I really liked the environment at the Max Planck Institute. Um, at a very, uh, I really liked my advisor. He was very caring and um, I just had a great experience working with him. Um, it was a very collaborative environment. I learned a huge amount that I think really prepared me well for graduate school. Uh, it was nice to have this time to really focus on research. So that was the sort of research side. I think it was a really good, it really helped prepare me for grad school. I got developed some habits that still serve me well um, today. But then uh, outside of research, I learned German. I worked really hard to um, to improve my language skills. I stayed with a host family who I met in a restaurant. I traveled uh, all around the country. I um, visited school, German, some German schools. 
Uh, I uh, taught a cosmology workshop for some high school students. So I uh, did a lot of different activities and uh, it was just a really fun and enriching year. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing experience. Uh, I think a lot of people should look at the Fulbright Scholarship as well. I've heard really good things about it. Um, so now getting into graduate school, why did you eventually end up choosing Caltech? And how did you end up choosing Professor Shri Kulkarni as your advisor? Right, so I had a really hard time deciding where to go to grad school. Uh, but I think in the end, it was a few things. I There were several professors at Caltech who I was interested in working with and I didn't want to risk going somewhere where I thought I'm going here to work with this person because, you know, it might not work out. Um, so I guess it felt like a low risk option in that sense. I, during my visit, I really liked uh, my impression of the graduate student community. It seemed like they were, um, you know, they were friends with each other, they supported each other and sort of, and worked hard to create a uh, supportive and welcoming environment for, for one another. Um, so that I really like that. And then um, I also didn't, I wanted just to experience something very different from what I'd experienced before. Um, at least in the US, I had only lived in Boston. So I thought, you know, if I can, I'd rather not stay in Boston. Uh, I'd never lived uh, in California. I'd spent very little time there. And so I think I was also excited about just uh, making a big move and making a big change and um, yeah, and sort of making uh, a new life for myself there. Yeah. Oh, and then, uh, and then Shri, uh, I think when I was looking at different advisors, I, you know, I tried to look at track records of who, which students people had had and what those students had gone on to do, what they had done as grad students. And I saw that Shri had sort of a long list of students who had done PhDs that I really um, admired, that they'd done amazing things during their PhDs. I saw that his students had won awards, had gotten uh, difficult to get fellowships and faculty jobs. And so I thought probably this is somebody who knows, has a, you know, knows how to design a thesis project or at least get a student going on a thesis project. Um, somebody who will go to bat for his students, because I think that's how you get these things is you have an advisor who's really willing to advocate for you and promote you. Um, and so I thought that, I think that was originally why I thought I wanted to try working with him. Um, I had also heard that he was a strong personality. Um, he, Shuri's policy is that the first year of working together is sort of a trial period for both of you. So at the end of it, either of you can kind of walk away and say, this is not a good fit. So I did this first year project with him um, and I I had a positive experience. And so I decided to, um, to continue working with him for my thesis. That's awesome. And now you have a really impressive track record too. So <laughs> I'm glad that worked out. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about some of the defining moments that you kind of went through at Caltech and some of the biggest lessons or takeaways that you gained from your experience there? Yeah, I mean, grad school is a really hard time. Um, I think it's a shock to go from, I mean, this is sort of the case when you go from high school to college, but I think it's even more extreme when you go from, when you go to grad school it's just incredibly, incredibly unstructured. You could do, you could spend your time in almost any way. You could work at home, you could go to the office, you could have whatever hours, you could work on almost anything because, I mean, it depends what kind of setup you have with your advisor, but I had an advisor who was fairly hands-off and so it wasn't like he was checking in on how I was doing. And so it was pretty much completely up to me how to manage everything and, that's something that I think takes people a really long time to learn. And so for the first couple of years of grad school, I think it's very common to feel very lost. Um, so that's, I guess, one thing. Um, I think also in grad school, it can be very easy for a lot of your life to be kind of dominated by this project. And it's an incredibly, you know, it's an astronomy what we're doing. It's pretty esoteric stuff at the end of the day. Um, and so you spend a lot of your time, mental energy, um, working on this project. And 
I think that if you're not careful, your sort of mood, your how you feel in general can become very coupled to how the project is going. So the project is going well, you feel great. And when the project is not going well, you can feel terrible. And I think learning how to sort of decouple your emotional state and kind of your life in general from how the project is going is really important for anyone who's going to be doing research as a career because you can't really control how the research is going to be going. Like sometimes things just won't work. Um, and I don't know that I even, I mean, it's something I even work on nowadays, but I think it was a problem that I noticed in grad school and realized that I had to start um, making deliberate efforts to uh, to work on. So that was some that was uh, that was something else. I um, I think also I remember with grad school. I remember all, I think also with my career, I can remember very strong phase changes. Um, things changed a lot in very short amounts of time. Um, and I think that maybe my takeaway is that you're learning a lot, even when you don't think you're learning a lot. Um, and then you only notice that it, you only notice when things kind of come together very abruptly. So uh, for example, I remember the first couple of years of grad school feeling like I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so I didn't really understand my project. I kind of I was getting, I was having a hard time getting up to speed with the literature the, I, I knew all this terminology, but I think I just didn't know it in kind of a deep way. Uh, it was all floating around inside of me. And then I went to this uh, theoretical uh, physics winter school in Jerusalem. I think it's something they do regularly there, although I'm not sure how often. And the subject was uh, sort of what I worked on. There was a whole uh, GRB, many lectures about GRBs, supernovae, relativistic explosions. And I remember sitting in these lectures and somehow everything I had read, things were just kind of coming together. And I remember having this just incredible phase change. I remember it as being during this meeting. I don't know if that's actually correct, but my memory is that during this meeting, I felt like so many of the things I had been learning finally kind of came together. And I felt like I actually really had a grasp of this subject. Um, and the same thing happened when I was preparing for my candidacy exam, things kind of came together in a very abrupt way. Um, and yeah, so I don't, it, I think grad school can be weird because you can be sort of feeling like you've no idea what's going on and then suddenly things can change a lot. So I don't know if that's uh, helpful for grad students to hear, but it might've been nice for me to know that um, when I was sort of in the woods. And then maybe one last thing I'll say is that I think something, um, one of the defining moments that I remember was uh, early on, I asked Shri to change my thesis project. So I actually was going to work on something completely different. Um, and I was really, wor I, I wasn't, I just wasn't enjoying it. It wasn't a good fit um, in terms of the just day-to-day -day of what I was doing. I just didn't really enjoy it. And I remember feeling so worried that I didn't know what to do. I thought, oh, if I tell him he'll fire me or something, I'll have to leave grad school. And then eventually I sort of worked up the, you know, I had a whole spiel prepared in my note. I went to his office and said, you know, this project is not a good fit for me. I, and I don't even know what I said. I don't think I was very articulate. It was kind of embarrassing, but he was extremely, um, you know, he barely reacted. He just said, oh, no problem. Uh, why don't you do this project? And it was a different project. And I was like, oh, okay. It just wasn't what I was expecting at all. And it just wasn't a big deal at all. And so I think I realized that, I mean, it was really nice actually, because I realized that to him, I wasn't just there to execute the specific project. He was interested in my development more broadly than just having this project get done um, immediately. Uh, and then also I think it felt very empowering to feel like I'm in grad school to get something particular out of this. You know, I want to work on a project that I enjoy and that I went to a kind of scary person <laughs> to uh, advocate for myself and ask uh, for that, uh, I think, yeah, it felt, um, it felt empowering. So that's one of the big moments that I remember from grad school. Yeah, that's definitely really good advice. I think for grad students everywhere. Um, and yeah, the Shree pipeline is pretty crazy. <laughs> all, the students, <laughs> all the students that I've worked with them have gone to do really amazing things and yeah, you're another one on the list now. So congrats. Um, <laughs> so now getting into the next chapter of your career, I guess, you like California so much you wanted to stay because you ended up at Berkeley. So what was your experience like as a postdoc there? Yeah, it was it was weird. It was COVID. So I graduated um, 
June uh, or July 2020 and then moved to Berkeley. And I don't think I met anybody in the astronomy department for months. I don't actually remember quite now what the timeline was, but it was, yeah, you know, it was two years of um, of a lot of people working from home, you know, including myself when things were kind of shut down. So I don't know that I really had a, I certainly didn't have a normal postdoc uh, experience, but at the same time, um, I really, I, I, I had decided that I wanted to go to Berkeley for a postdoc because of a few things. One was that I wanted to get more computational skills. And um, I had worked before with someone at uh, LBL who was really good at all these kinds of things and who I wanted to learn from. Um, I really wanted to spend more time trying to interpret some of the phenomena that I've been finding. So I wanted to be in a department with theorists who are interested in the kinds of things I was working on. And so Berkeley had that. So Berkeley had this good combination of things. And I think I remember um, talking to uh, actually a mentor from my time in Germany about what I was hoping to get out of the postdoc time. You know, what is the point of a postdoc? And he said something like, you know, if you don't learn anything, you've wasted your time. <laughs> so I think, and then it made me realize, yeah, that's right. It can be good to go into these experiences, articulating to yourself, what is it that I want to get out of this? And what is it that I want to learn? Because what's so fun about this career is that you get to keep learning um, for your whole, uh, for your whole life. And um, actually, that reminds me of another thing that made a strong impression on me from grad school, which is Shri pulling out an undergrad physics textbook to remind himself of some basic thermodynamics thing, and me realizing that Shri doesn't know everything, and he still has to sort of remind himself of, you know, basic physics all the time that he needs. And yeah, and I think that made a strong impression on me because... Um, it's, it's, the reason I'm thinking about that right now is because I think one of the things that I've been learning is just how much everybody at every career stage in academia is always still learning. And so there's no shame in feeling like you don't remember something or you don't know something because you just uh, pull out a book and learn it. So, uh, so yeah, I don't remember what I was talking about. Oh yeah, Berkeley, right. So at Berkeley, I was trying to learn more theory and I was trying to learn more computational skills. Um, and so I think I was still able to do that, even though I was uh, at home <laughs> for a lot of the time. And when I had, I was doing a program, this Miller Fellowship, that was a sort of interdisciplinary program. So there were postdocs from lots of different fields uh, of science. And that was really great. I loved that. Um, I made really good friends. I got to learn about lots of different things. And I think it was nice because the grad school and also a postdoc can be this just incredibly focused time. And so having a venue where the whole point of the venue was to be a bit broader and learn about things outside your research area uh, was something I really enjoyed and appreciated. Sorry, the next question was mine. I thought it was Simi's. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so talking about, I guess, postdocs in general now, uh, I guess given the uncertainties in the job market, especially today, how did you best deal with sort of like all the uncertainty that comes with a postdoc? Um, and like you were able to like sort of excel during your time at Berkeley and make a lot of the experience, even though there's like so much uncertainty given the position these days. Yeah, I think something else I feel like I've been learning, maybe even going back to grad school, is that there's uncertainty at every stage and not just professionally. There's uncertainty in many different areas of one's life. And one of the things I think one has to learn to do is how to sort of simultaneously hold all of this uncertainty in your mind and then still kind of function on a day-to-day -day basis and still set goals and still try to achieve those goals. Um, even when you know that ultimately there's just a huge amount of uncertainty around everything. Um, and so I so I guess that's just I guess, very broadly, um, something that I think everybody sort of has to learn to do for themselves, but maybe more specifically, professionally, in astronomy, you know, I've always known that a job in this field uh, is not guaranteed, it's not even likely. Um, but I think the way that I've coped with that is just by always reminding myself that there's so many things I would love to do in the world 
and so many jobs that I think I would enjoy having that even if astronomy doesn't work out, I mean, fine, I'll just go get a different job <laughs> and I'll enjoy it. Uh, I'll enjoy it just as much. So I think knowing that the worst case scenario is really still a great scenario uh, makes it easier just to try to enjoy the time that you have um, doing this kind of work. And honestly, also astronomy has cons. There are downsides to this job. And so also sometimes reminding myself that it's not like this is literally the greatest job and better than all other jobs in every way. Uh, there are many other things that would be great to do. Uh, I have always found helpful. And I think it always helps to keep in touch with some of these other interests that you have, you know, keep up, keeping up with hobbies, with friends who are not just other astronomers, um, being sort of constantly uh, reminding yourself of the world outside of the field, I think can also be, uh, can also be really helpful. Yeah, that's a really great way to kind of think about things and you can use it in any situation. So great advice. Um, now we're going to move into like your time as a professor. Um, what was the application process like for you and how did you end up getting hired at Cornell? Yeah, the, um, let's see, it's kind of a blur now. The application process was, it was similar to, you know, other application processes, a research statement, um, statement, uh, teaching state, uh, teaching statement, um, statement about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think those are standard parts now of, um, of faculty applications. And then after that, uh, things really vary a lot. So different places may or may not have a long list interview where you just do a 15 minute kind of screener interview um, to bring things down from 20, 30 people to six people. Um, and then for the, I think, pretty much all places have shortlist interviews. So you'll go there, you'll give a colloquium or a seminar, and then you have a couple of days totally packed with uh, nonstop meetings. So from you know 9 a.m. you're meeting with people and then they take you out to dinner. So you're going from nine to nine, um, just talking with people. And it's basically a two day long interview. So that's what the process is like. And then, um, and, and, and they can vary a lot in their formality. So some places it'll be very informal. You just kind of chat with people. You walk into somebody's office and they kind of, you know, clearly forgot you were even coming. <laughs> so it ranges from that to very formal, structured. Everyone has their prepared questions. Um, really more like a, a sort of what you think of as a job interview. So yeah, I think this thing, this kind of thing can vary a lot depending on the place. And then, um, so what was the second part of the question? Why I ultimately went to Cornell? Um, that was also, you know, it was a difficult decision, I think, and it was a complicated decision. The faculty decision is very different, at least for me, it was very different from something like the postdoc decision or the grad school decision, where uh, I think now it's just, there were so many more dimensions to it. It was sort of environment, but also geographic location. Um, things, considerations like proximity to family, um, what works for uh, what works for one's partner, where one's partner is going to be able to get a job, um, what kind of research will one be able to do, does the place have the resources that you need to get it done, what will be, uh, will you be able to have students who you're um, excited to work with, what will the teaching responsibilities be? What will the service commitments be? How do all these things fit into what your goals are? Um, it's just really, uh, really complicated. So it's like a 100D problem that you're trying to think about. So I don't know that I can really say uh, that it was something I just sort of solved and this is sort of clearly the right answer, but I felt, you know, reasonably confident that I was going to be comfortable in the department, um, that my colleagues uh, were very collegial, um, that I could be happy living here uh, in Ithaca, that my partner would be happy living here and able to find a job that is not just sort of fine, but something he's genuinely really excited about. Um, I, you know, I liked that uh, it's close to family for both of us. 
Um, my I have a lot of family in New York City. He has a lot of family in Michigan. So it's kind of actually right in between. Um, I felt like I I was excited about the kind of intellectual environment here. Um, there are lots of people who I enjoyed talking to uh, and was interested in working with. And I guess scientifically, the department has uh, an emphasis on some millimeter astronomy, which is a sort of wave. I mean, it sounds very, very specific, but I guess it, it's a very particular, it requires very particular technical, um, uh, it requires very specific technology. Maybe I could say it's very different from say radio astronomy. And uh, Cornell really has a lot of uh, the sort of world's experts in building those kinds of facilities. And I think I've always liked being in places where people are building things, building telescopes, part of what I liked about Caltech. Um, and then I'm interested in some millimeter astronomy because it's kind of a new thing. And there are a lot of things we can learn about the kinds of phenomena that I study uh, at those wavelengths. So that was another piece of this kind of complicated uh, puzzle. But I, I wouldn't say it was a sort of simple, this is, this is why, and therefore I went. Yeah, that sounds like a really complicated problem to have, but it's, <laughs> I think it really helps to hear sort of your insight throughout the whole process. Hopefully one day I have to make those decisions and then I'll remember the things you said probably and <laughs> like that. But yeah, um, so I guess getting into your specifics of your time in Cornell so far, um, you just finished your first semester. So was it sort of everything you expected it to be? And what were some surprises you faced, if any? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it was... So I'm not teaching yet. I have a, a semester off teaching and that was to help me get settled in. So I think I have not yet experienced kind of normal professor life. Um, I think it was actually pretty similar to what I expected in the sense, yeah, pretty similar to what I expected, um, but maybe even more so I was pleasantly surprised just by how welcoming everybody was. I mean, I didn't expect them to be sort of be not welcoming, but it just people went out of their way to, I got a really nice office. Um, I, uh, people sort of were coming by to check, people still even come by to sort of check in on how I'm doing. Um, Cornell has a lot of resources for, you know, if you have some question about something, almost anything, there's somebody who will help you. Um, and I don't think I necessarily realize how easy um, it was going to be to to get help for almost any kind of question that I would have. Um, I think it's an adjustment. It, it, it's kind of funny because the what I do on a day-to-day -day basis actually hasn't changed that much yet because I'm not teaching yet. So a lot of my time is still spent doing research kind of like when I was a postdoc. And yet the mentality has changed a lot. You know, suddenly I have a very different kind of position. I have more power. I have more responsibilities. I feel more responsibility. Um, I'm now, uh, at a very different career stage from a grad student when just a couple of years ago, I was a grad student. And so I think that kind of shift in just thinking is something that maybe I wasn't, I'm not sure that I had really, um, thought a lot about that before actually starting. So that was just an, an aspect of the transition that I think is one has to kind of confront, uh, that I, yeah, maybe I just hadn't thought so much about that before, but it's been, um, it's been good so far. Uh, it's, yeah, I think, yeah, I, maybe I'll just uh, leave it there. Yeah, that's good to hear. Um, so I hope things still go really smoothly and well when you start teaching this semester. Uh, yeah. Or do you know what class you are? Yes, yeah, so I'm teaching a, a grad seminar uh, this semester on sort of reading reading papers and literature. And then in the fall, um, I'll probably teach a sort of advanced undergrad kind of survey class. And then the next spring, probably radiative processes. So lots coming up. Yeah, fun classes, radiative processes for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love radiative processes. So i um, very excited to teach it. Definitely. So uh, I guess now getting into a little bit about your identity. So have you felt that people have ever underestimated you or treated you differently in a professional setting because of your identity as an Asian woman? And how have you sort of overcome those biases during your career? And also, how have there been times you felt your opportunities have been different because you're mixed and because of your intersectionality? Yeah, that's a great question. 
I think that you know, there have certainly been experiences I've had, interactions I've had where afterwards I sort of ask myself, would that have gone differently if I were different from the way that I am? Or did that happen because I'm a woman? Um, I mean, I've been very lucky in the sense that I haven't had negative interactions that were kind of explicitly um, negative for those reasons. And I know uh, a number of people who have, so so I have been lucky. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that when you are part of a group that is not well represented in your professional circles is that it is harder to find mentors who are similar to you. And one of, so I, when I started as a professor here, I did this program uh, for new faculty that was actually extremely helpful. And one of the uh, themes of one of the themes of this program was ident it was sort of creating a mentor network for yourself. And one of the things they emphasized is that you know, we all need many mentors because each mentor will maybe be a mentor to us, uh, be a mentor to just a specific part of ourselves. So maybe you have a mentor for how to do science or how to do research, maybe a mentor for how to balance research with um, some of your other priorities. Um, maybe you have a mentor for, yeah. So you can just think there are so many things that are important to you and you're not going to find anybody who is helpful to you for all of those things. But I think that the one thing that for me has been challenging um, is just because you know, I've, I've been extremely lucky. I've had amazing mentors, but I haven't really had many mentors, if any, who I thought this person is similar to me. And so there are aspects of my life or sort of areas of my life or priorities of mine where um, it hasn't been easy to find some, find a kind of role model for that. Uh, so I'd say that that's um, been one of the challenges. Um. Yeah, I, I kind of can relate to that. I've been trying to create a network, but it's hard as like the fields that we're in are pretty predominantly white and male, but I hope that that starts to change in the future. Yeah, um, absolutely. So you you seem so busy always working on research and now at this <laughs> new place. How do you make time for yourself and your hobbies during your busy schedule? Yeah, so I've, um, this is something I've really worked on a lot over the years, uh, starting in grad school. I'm very, I try really hard to have dedicated work hours and to sort of decide, well, so yeah, one thing, having dedicated work hours. So I try to get up pretty early, um, but then I try to stop uh, basically before dinner. So dinner is for me the kind of transition from work to non-work. So, and I also physically go to my office. I leave a lot of my stuff there and then I go home, cook dinner. I sort of like cooking as a way to unwind and then eat and then I'm done. So I try really hard when I can not to bring um, work home in the evenings. And for the most part, I can get away with it. Um, and I also think when you do that, when you tell yourself for this kind of, I also split up the day into, um, sort of chunks of time for different tasks. And I try to accomplish the task in the time that I've allocated to it. And I think that's been really helpful because otherwise you end up in a situation where these things can just take infinite time and they can kind of end up ruling you. <laughs> and so you need to tell the task, this is how long you are going to take. Uh, so I think that that is very important. And then also just accepting that things won't be perfect. Um, when you're done with them. So that's been good because it means that, you know, you show up, you know, you have two hours to do this one thing. That means you have to figure out what is really important, what is really important to do, what is kind of essential to do first, and then what can I get away with not being perfect in this task? So yeah, I'm very, um, I try to be very organized and prioritize and keep things, uh, sort of the work day to the work day and then go home. Um, and I try not to work at home. So that's, that's one thing that I do. Um, I try to also, um, yeah, I have mean, many things I could talk about, you know, I have various uh, activities that I like to do and people like to do them with. And I have ways of, um, every week 
I review sort of, I, I have this sort of weekly check-in thing that I do and then a monthly check-in thing that I do to sort of set priorities for the next week, for the next month. And those um, things that I do include not just priorities for work, but also for other parts of my life and things that I like doing. And I sort of try to um, really dedicate time to all of those things. I don't know if that actually makes sense. So, but basically I think trying to be really organized maybe is the, um, is the short answer, which it doesn't always work. Sometimes everything falls apart, but um, I try. Yeah, that sounds like a really, like, really, like, very structured way of, like, sort of approaching, like, the schedule that you have, and I feel like that's kind of helpful. Maybe I should do something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I, yeah, yeah, I could talk actually a lot about um, organizational <laughs> systems because it's something that uh, I'm sort of interested in, but, um, but yeah, I won't uh, go on and on about it. <laughs> Let me know if you want recommendations for <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> books and things. So now getting into sort of like your future. Um, so what are some of the main goals that you have in mind that you want to achieve for the rest of your career? And how do you sort of want to leave your mark on the field? So I guess like when you end up retiring, like what do you want people to really remember like you doing? Yeah, that's, it's a really good question. And I, when when I saw, um, when I heard the question, I, it's funny. It makes me realize that I don't think in that way first maybe I should but my priorities and my goals have changed so much even just in the last five years or so that I think some part of me kind of knows that I am even if I tried to set goals now for my retirement that things are just going to look so different in even just a few years um and you know scientifically this field is interesting because it it changes very quickly. So, it, you know, in grad school, I started out working on this particular thesis project, and everything got completely upended because of the transient that happened to occur in the universe. And then and my interests changed a lot because of that. I sort of went on to completely different trajectories that I hadn't been planning to go on. Um, so even at the beginning of grad school, if you'd said, what do you want to achieve by the end of grad school? I would have said something and then I would have been completely sort of wrong. So I'm very conscious of that. So it's very difficult for me to answer. I think, and I don't even know, I mean, there's so many dimensions to a successful career in, in academia that, you know, I don't think I'd be happy, even if I say I... I don't know, answered some really important questions in our field, but I didn't do anything else with my life. I don't think I feel very content actually. So I think maybe one way to phrase it would be that I want to have a balanced life. And I think what that means will change and is changing. Um, but I think I will want to feel like I, yeah, maybe would want to have a balanced life. Um, and I think that means it means a lot of things. One of the things it means to me is that I'm, I think sometimes we think of, you know, being a scientist is this very sort of focused uh, endeavor and we set goals that are kind of within our field, but, you know, all of us are also citizens of a country, we're members of a department, we're maybe members of an institution like university, we are um, residents of a town or a city and also sort of citizens of the world. And I guess, I feel like for me, maybe maybe one another way to answer the question would be that I think I'd want to feel like I made at least some small, uh, tried to do my part at kind of each of these levels. Like I tried to do something in my capacity as, a sort of member of a global community. I tried to do something in my capacity as a member of a university, of a department, a person in a field, um, a person, you know, a, a citizen of a country. Uh, and I don't mean really big things like, yeah, I don't know that me just uh, can, that I can do so much, but that I at least thought in those ways and um, tried to, uh, yeah, I think I would feel at the end in, in retirement, like I would feel very proud if I felt like my life was not um, 
totally just absorbed by uh, by my work, which ultimately is really fun and intellectually stimulating. But um, you know, there are many other things that are important outside of it too. I think that's awesome. Like that's really admirable, and I think you have to be really like self aware to sort of recognize that. So um, that's great. Um, but just like a more general question, not so much about you personally, but how do you think we can make the astrophysics community more inclusive and equitable for the next generations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and maybe yeah, I'll just focus on a couple of things. You know, one is that I think, I think that there can be, and there is to some extent, both in the field, but also out of the field, you know, among the public, um, very kind of specific ideas about what it means to be a good scientist. People have very kind of particular mental models of the good scientist. And one of the things that I've learned in my career so far that I've observed is that science, at least today, I don't know how it was in the past, but science today is a huge and complicated ecosystem. And you need to have people who have different strengths, who have different values. Um, and you need many different kinds of good scientists. And so I think one of the things we all need to do is to deliberately be open-minded about all the different ways in which people can be really great at what they do and make a really important contribution. And I wouldn't claim to even be able to have the, I wouldn't claim to have the imagination to do that. And then, and that might maybe brings me to a second point, which is that I think we all need to be deliberately creating diverse environments and diverse communities. And that is in many ways that's in, you know, that comes into play in a lot of ways in admissions for college, for grad school, in uh, inviting speakers to a conference and um, putting together any kind. And when you, and whenever you deliberately assemble some kind of community to really make a point to make it diverse, because I think at the end of the day, there's only such an extent to which any given person can really be, uh, can really imagine all the different ways of doing things. And so you just need to have uh, many different people there. I think there's no way around that. So, um, and I think even just a bit of conscientious conscientiousness and deliberation about that can, um, can really make a huge difference. So. Yeah, I think that's that's really good advice for the community for sure. Um, hopefully, like with people like you spearheading like this next generation in the field, like it'll become a definitely like a better field. Is what I hope. So yeah, uh, hopeful for the future for sure. So now getting into sort of the end of our interview, we usually like to end with some quick hitters. So the first one we want to know is you mentioned in the form that you filled out that you go bird watching. So what is <laughs> your favorite bird? <laughs> Uh, so I really, really love owls. Um, I actually saw one just last weekend, uh, a barred owl. But I think maybe my, it's kind of hard to pick a favorite owl because they're all so cute, but maybe the burrowing owl because they live in the ground. And so I feel like they're kind of different from what you expect owls to do. That's really cute. I think that's something I want to try just because <laughs> it sounds very relaxing, bird watching. Um, the next one's what's your favorite type of stellar death? <laughs> um, probably this phenomenon that I've been studying over the last few years, where we we actually don't know what it even is, and might not even be a stellar death. But one of the main hypotheses is that they are a stellar death, and the um, sort of prototype member of this class was a transient called AT twenty eighteen COW, um, or the cow. So uh, I think the cow and its ilk are my favorite kinds of candidate stellar deaths. Yeah, uh, that event was very interesting for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so when we talked at the CTF meeting, you mentioned that you like watching the Premier League and your favorite team is Man U. So you guys are doing well, <laughs> you guys are doing well right now. So yeah, actually are... things are really, things are really looking up. <laughs> so what are your, uh, who are your top three favorite Man U players currently? Um, I really like Luke Shaw. I played, I was a fullback when I played on the soccer team in junior high school or something. 
Um, yeah, so I, I like Luke Shaw. Um, I really like Marcus Rashford. He seems very nice. And I like uh, David De Gea. He's come and saved us many times. It's a big game tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, the last one we have for you is what are your top three favorite foods? Um, I think one of them has to be laksa, uh, which is this Singaporean dish. I grew, I was born in Singapore. Um, and it's this really yummy kind of curry noodle soup. Uh, I really like sushi. I have basically my whole life. That was always my sort of birthday meal of choice. Um, and specifically, I have a thing for California rolls for some reason. So that's probably one of my favorite dishes. And then um, as a third dish, one of the fun things at Cornell is that they uh, the university makes its own ice cream. Um, and it's really good. So it's the place here is called the Dairy Bar. And over this holiday season, they had a new flavor called Merry Mint, which was kind of a peppermint, um, pepperminty kind of colorful ice cream that I think also had white chocolate in it or something and it's extremely yummy so that's the third one wow well that's those are all the questions that we have from you now I want to go to Cornell and try this ice cream <laughs> <laughs> yeah you should <laughs> well thank you both so much for um for I mean for creating this whole uh podcast and for inviting me to be on it um, thanks for all your questions. I think it's great that you're doing this. Yeah, of course. Thank you for being a guest, Anna. We really appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, we really appreciate you having you on. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Hey, have a, um, have a great weekend. You, you too. too. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye.